I'm working on the Ethereum Foundation, at the Ethereum Foundation on the project Sourceify. And today I will be talking about how we can enable more human-friendly contract interactions using Sourceify verification. I'll start with uh, showing you guys something you're all familiar with. I would say if you're a Web3 user for a while, um, just a normal day in Web3. And I guess this will, this will be like something you see every day. And you see every day in Web3, you see things like this and you basically have no idea. You're not a machine. You don't understand what's going on. You're like trying to make sense of it. Am I doing the right thing? Am I talking to the right contract? Is this doing actually what I want to do? And basically, what you do is telling them to like shut up and take your money. Like you have no idea what's going on. You're just giving out your money. And we say today, uh, a typical web free interaction is still a YOLO signing nightmare, what we call YOLO signing. It's just they give you things to sign, and you just like sign on, hope for the best. So at the end of the day, what we want to have is more to do something on the right-hand side, from left-hand side to right-hand side. So I know this has changed, actually, for many wallets. So many wallets actually started to uh, decode things, like MetaMask using Truffle. Um, and decoding the ABI, but still we have a long way to go, and we have a lot of things that we can improve the human, the, the user experience. So what can you do to achieve this? There are two sides of, what, of this coin. So you can, there are things you can do as the wallet developer, and there are things you can do as the, um, as the smart contract developer. So let's dive in what you can do as the smart contract developer. Um, the first thing you can do is using a NAT spec documentation and as well as doing the source code verification on Sourceify. So what is NAT spec documentation? NAT spec documentation is what is called Ethereum natural language specification format. It's actually part of the Solidity spec. Uh, and probably you have seen this if you have seen a contract before. This is how it looks like. You put uh, the comment, the documentation above the function and you have the developer documentation, you have the user documentation with the at notice uh, field, and you have the documentation for the parameters. Uh, so another nice thing about NatSpec is it has the specification for dynamic expression. So the field you see here, uh, the old owner and new owner uh, parameters in back quotes, uh, these actually can be filled dynamically with the value they are being called. So this replaces the owner, blah, blah, the address gets filled, can get filled, and the new owner can also get filled in, in the parameters. Okay, so you, 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 you did your job. You made the user documentation, developer documentation. So where do you find it then? Where, where can I where can find it? It is uh, in the Solidity contract metadata. So who actually knows what Solidity contract metadata is? Anyone? Just a few people? Cool. That's why I'm here. Um, so contract metadata is actually something introduced early on in 2016 in the earlier versions, but it was actually not really picked up by the community. Uh, it is actually a JSON file uh, generated by the compiler itself, uh, and it contains the metadata. OK, but what is metadata? It has the ABI, the user doc, dev doc, uh, as well as compilation info and source file info. Uh, so the first two fields uh, actually is concerned with how to interact with the contract, so how to interface with the contract. And then the second two is about uh, how to reproduce a contract compilation, so it uh, embeds the information during the contract compilation so that it can be reproduced. Uh, the file looks like this. It's a JSON file. It has, as I said, it has a compiler language, settings, source file information. Uh, and here, for example, in the output, you can see the user doc and dev doc. And if we open that field, those fields again, 
you have the methods, and with the methods for each method, you have the um, notice field or the dev, dev doc field if there's a dev doc, uh, and you have the, for example, in this case, the replaces the new owner with uh, the old owner with new owner. The comment we have seen before. Uh, you can get the, con the metadata with the metadata flag on the compiler itself. Uh, on with the frameworks, you can find it inside the build files. So Truffle, for example, puts this in inside the build contracts, the contract name JSON. Under that, you can find the metadata fields, and the, the metadata is there. Hardhat also started to output metadata. Uh, for inside the build file, again, you can find the metadata here. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can also find the traces of the metadata in, inside the bytecode. Uh, so the bytecode, this is an example contract bytecode, and the bytecode uh, has actually a special field at the end of the bytecode. It is appended by the compiler. Again, a question, who knows what this is? Okay, again, just a few people, and again, what's, that's why I'm here. Uh, so this field, uh, the compiler actually takes the IPFS hash of the metadata file, the file we saw, and it encodes the IPFS hash of that file here, alongside some other information. Maybe I'll pull, pull this as well. Alongside some other information. And yeah, you can see how this works in our playground, Playground Sourceify Dev. Uh, we basically show how the encoding is done, what the encoding contains, and we also try to fetch metadata from IPFS. It's already there. So it's a nice tool. Um, there are some example contracts you can click on, or you can just provide us with the contract address, or just paste the contract bytecode, and we, we will try to visualize how this thing works. All right, let's, let's go down to the second thing, source code verification on source file. But before, what is source code verification? So this is, for all of you know, this is like, you probably have seen this if you have seen a contract before. And you see a green check mark, you're happy, you know the contract, right? Um, OK, but how does this work? Um, maybe before that, like it is, uh, the reason we need, why we need source code verification is that the contracts actually live on blockchain as bytecodes. Like they are, we write, we humans write code in human language, but the machines read it in bytes, so the code gets compiled and deployed to the uh, blockchain, and this information is lost in the process. So we need to somehow make sure uh, just a random code you see is actually the, say, the code behind the contract. So that's the process of knowing this code is actually the one that is running the contract is source code verification. So how does this work? Uh, you have the uh, contracts, solidity files. In this case, you have a target contract. You also have compilation settings, like the version, the optimizer settings, the other things. And we feed those into a compiler, and we recompile the contract. And remember, this is actually when the second part of the metadata information comes in handy. So we use this compilation info to reproduce the compilation of the contract again. So we uh, feed this to the compiler, and the compiler gives us a bytecode. And we also have the contract that we want to uh, verify. So we get the code of the contract from the blockchain. This will give us a bytecode. Then we'll see if these actually match. And in Sourceify, we also have two types of matches. We have the partial match when bytecodes match, and we have the full match when both the bytecode and the metadata field, field match. So in Right now, today, when you are verifying on Etherscan or any other verifier, they actually ignore this field. Like, they don't make use of this field. They just trim it out. And actually, that there have been cases that this was um, exploited. So it wasn't a serious thing, but this, could, this wasn't really doing, was being done properly. But yeah, with the full match, you have a um, complete match of the bytecode. Uh, and here, the metadata actually acts as a compilation fingerprint. So, uh, if you match the metadata as well, it means 
the compilation is exactly the same as the original, or as when the uh, contract was deployed. So, and the full matches actually cryptographically guarantee that the whole compilation is exactly the same, including the solidity files, comments, spaces, variable names, anything. Like you, even if you change a, a space, a variable name, it will break the match. So how does this work? Let's see how this actually works. Uh, again, when you are compiling your contract, the compiler takes the hash of each file, each, each solidity file. Then the hashes of these files are actually embedded inside the metadata file, our, the, the metadata file that we saw, as well as the other sources, not just one. Then, as said, the compiler takes the IPFS hash of this whole file, and then this IPFS hash is embedded at the end of the bytecode. And then we see if these match. If it's a full match, it's a match, it's a full match, if they match. And let's see what happens when you change something, when you make a slight change, change the space, change the variable name, any comments. So we have a, my contract diff this time. So the hash of the file will change. Then the hash inside the metadata will change. And in, in turn, the hash of the metadata file itself will change. So this field will be different this time. And that means this will not be a full match, and, but this will be a partial match. Assuming you didn't make a change that will change the functionality of the contract, just a comment or variable. OK, but then how to verify? Uh, so you can use the Sourceify UI. You can give us the source code and the metadata file. We need the metadata file to be able to verify. Uh, either from your computer or Etherscan, remote, GitHub, however you like. Then you give us the contract address, contract chain, we try to verify. You can use the API. We have an API endpoint and other several API endpoints as well. You can check them out in docs.sourceify.dev. Uh, we have some detailed docs about this. And uh, we also have the tooling. Uh, so if you are using Hardhat, there's a Hardhat deploy plugin. Uh, and with the plugin, when, after you deploy your contract, you can just pass the network flag and then say Sourceify and easily verify your contract. We have the Remix plugin. If you are using Remix, you can provide uh, the contract address, the chain, then we will verify. Uh, we recently have uh, Foundry support. So using Foundry, you can also easily verify your contracts. And we also have uh, some automatic verification, so what we call monitor. Um, so we have a monitor running that is listening on on several chains. We are right now listening to Ethereum mainnet, testnets, as well as some rollups, as far as I remember. Uh, so the monitor, what it does, it catches contract creations. And then when it finds a contract creation, it will uh, fetch the metadata. As you remember, it's like IPFS hash is over there. So it will get the IPFS hash, try to fetch it from IPFS. And also, the metadata file has the source hashes, source IPFS hashes. It will try to get the source files from IPFS as well. If it finds them, then it will automatically compile and try to, try to verify the contract. So that means, actually, the second step here, the source code verification on Sourceify, has become publishing your metadata. So you don't even have to take the extra step and go to Sourceify and verify your contract. If you just publish it and pin it, uh, on IPFS, we'll just do it for you. Yeah. Um, so we have this contract repo of all verified contracts. It is served over HTTP and IPFS under repo.sourceify.dev. Um, so we pin uh, the verified source, verified contract source files and the metadata uh, so that they will be accessible by decoding the bytecode. So here, remember, there is the IPFS hash here. And anyone, if, if it's verified on Sourceify, we will be pinning it. And there are other people uh, pinning our repo as well. So you, they will be accessible by their IPFS hash. And yeah, we also serve the repo under an IPNS name, um, uh, repo.sourceify.dev. So you can also see the contract repo and see the files, access all of them, download the whole repo if you want. So yeah. Uh, OK, so we have seen what you can do as a smart contract dev. Uh, let's see what you can do as a wallet developer. So maybe a short recap uh, what we are trying to do again. So, so we have a contract call. 
we are talking to a contract, and instead of showing, instead of this byte string, we want to show something more user friendly. So one thing to do is obviously to decode this call, this byte string call, uh, via the ABI JSON. Uh, you can show the function name, the variable names, etc. And then you want to show some human readable description of what the user is trying to do if you have documented your code well. Um, so what you, what you can do as a wallet developer, you go to Sourceify, you repo.sourceify dev, you get the chain ID, the contract, and the metadata. No, please don't do that. You don't come to us because it's already in on IPFS. And it is. The neat thing is it's content, addre content address, so you know the file you're getting is actually the right file. So you just, your wallet just gets the bytecode of the contract, decodes the IPFS hash here at the end of the bytecode, fetch the metadata uh, that we pinned it for you, uh, and the metadata file has, as we have seen, the ABI and the documentation. Yeah. This is where the first two fields come in handy, how to interface with the contract, and then decode the ABI and populate the not spec comments of the contract. So hopefully at the end of the day, we will have something more on the right rather than something on the left. But Sourceify is actually not the only way for human friendliness. Uh, the idea behind Sourceify is to have human readable descriptions via not spec, comments found in the metadata, there are other ways to achieve this as well. So one is, for example, these two EIPs uh, by Richard Moore and Nick Johnson. So the idea there is to have an extra function name, uh, an extra function, a describe function, so to say, that will return the user something human readable. Uh, so it, it can be anything, any custom, any custom string. And uh, the contract will return the string to the user and continue executing the, executing the actual function. And here, the nice thing is it can decode things like ENS commit that is normally uh, like the, it's, it's an hash commit and it doesn't have a meaning to the user, but you can add actually some more custom strings, custom messages to the user that they can make sense of it. Uh, but obviously, this, this costs extra gas. Uh, the other one is another uh, IP proposal by Dan Finley. The, there, the idea is uh, to give the user this information at the first point of contact. So say you want to do an exchange for the first time in, at Uniswap, Uniswap app, app.uniswap will give you the contract metadata, uh, your wallet will store it, and then uh, it, you, your wallet will have the ABI and the describers so that uh, it can show you some hum, something more human readable. Uh, the advantage here is it's backwards compatible, so we don't need to change, change the contracts. Right now, most of the contracts don't have any documentation or anything, and or they are not actually documented with the human friendliness in mind. So this will be backwards compatible, but at the same time, this means it's mutable. So it's like it can be changed. Uh, so it's a trade-off. But yeah, and also there are many ways to the better UX. So we can actually show the users many things. So is it uh, you can decode the contract call? You can warn if the user has never been talk to this contract, uh, show the user if the contract is verified, uh, block if it's a scam address, um, many things, as well as um, other types of things such, such as how many times this contract was interacted with, when was it deployed, because a scam the contract would be like likely more recent and less interacted with. Um, is this contract audited, and is it by, audited by whom? So there are actually many ways we can do better. So as a recap, what is Sourceify? Uh, technically, it is an open source automatic smart contract verification service, our monitor. It's a user interface, server, uh, API, and tooling to verify contracts manually. It's a public decentralized content address storage of verified contracts, our repo. And more generally, we are a base layer and a public good for other tools to build on top of us. Uh, and we are an initiative to foster the use of Solidity metadata uh, not spec and full verification. And as well as we are an ongoing effort uh, to improve smart contracts, safety, and transparency. So thank you for listening. Uh, if, you have, if you're interested, you can find us in Twitter, join our Matrix chats. Uh, our code is also at here, ethereum.sourceify. Ethereum Visit our website. 
And yeah, I'll be happy to take any other questions if you have. Thank you. I'm wondering how well these solutions can handle translation and internationalizations to provide descriptions in multiple mm -hmm. languages. Yeah, uh, that's also one consideration. There, uh, we have the idea of may maybe having a, a custom NatSpec field for translations. And in that field, you can actually uh, link to another translations file. So that would be inside the metadata, for example, the translations file. And that will be another IP IPFS hash so that you can fetch it and you can have other languages and translations. Are you thinking about uh, UX regression testing automation somehow? Sorry? Be, uh, um, are you thinking about end-to-end -end regression testing automation with Sourceify? So being able to include um, the dApps in the whole cycle of testing how things look like, like what can Dapps do to make things easier for end users to. So having, understand. I'm sorry, is it having the uh, Sourceify at the whole development pipe pipeline? You mean, or I'm not sure if I get sorry. correct. Um, right, currently, in order for a developer to somehow test the end-to-end -end user experience, mm -hmm. it's nearly impossible to include the web app and the wallet interaction and the on-chain interactions. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if I get the question uh, correctly, but we are more like a, um, well, so we are not, we just say people, here it is, here are the tools, here are the files, just please make use of it. So we don't actively get involved in the UX, contract interactions or that not, not in the whole complete pipeline, I would say. For user protection, am I right in thinking that the uh, reputational and statistical characteristics you mentioned are really important? Oh, um, sorry, who's talking? Right here. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a malicious deployer could create a malicious contract, dis uh, describe it in a malicious way with NAT spec, and then yeah. take advantage of the user. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously we have the assumption that the contract deployer is uh, fine. It's not malicious. So it's, uh, we verify the content of the, uh, the, the contract. But there are, as I said, there are other ways to do that. For example, audits, uh, scam lists. So this is another aspect. So we have like this neutral eye to what's inside the contract. And it's up to the community and the um, other types of methods to actually see it's not um, a, a malicious contract. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so question I had was for contract coverage, like what is it, like is it limited to what's verified on Etherscan or um, like, I, like, yeah, in terms of like ABIs that might not be fully complete, like what is Sourceify fully cover? What, what do you mean by cover? Uh, in terms of like contract coverage, like if someone deploys a new contract, it's not verified on Etherscan, then do you guys still provide um, the human readable aspect or? Yes, I mean, Sourceify is quite completely different thing than Etherscan. Etherscan right. is both a verification service and a block explorer, but Sourceify is not a block explorer. We, just, we are just a contract verification service and I would say we have different contract sets than Etherscan. So you can gotcha. actually import, but uh -huh. it's a different contract set. So even for like new contracts, you guys instantly get into the pipeline, yeah. verify it, and then make it readable. Yeah, exactly. Okay, gotcha. Any okay. any contract that is deployed, we can just verify. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, cool. And even also different chains, like we don't we have I think like thirty something EVM chains right now. Mm -hmm. So you can even verify contracts on other chains. But at the end of the day, actually we 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 have support for different chains, but we actually want everyone at some point to run their own Sourceify for their own chains. Cool. OK, thank you. Maybe last question. Um, is it in the scope of Sourceify to like maintain reputation of the comments, or maybe even validate the comments actually reflect the code? The, what document? Sorry, the like, sound here is not so good. Uh, is it in the scope of Sourceify to uh, maintain like a reputation score for the comments? or uh, to validate if the comments reflect the code? The application commits, you say? Yeah, the comments. Comments. 
Um, I mean, no, we, we just, as I said, we are a tool to achieve this, and at the end of the day, the developers have to de document and co comment their uh, code. So they have to keep in mind that this, will, this might be a user-facing method and properly document it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, just find me uh, after the talk, or also you can yeah, find Sourceify and reach us out there. Thank you. <laughs>